the marriage of the biblical tradition and Greco-Roman culture produced Western civilization. That's a strong statement, but it is hard to overestimate the importance of the biblical tradition of Christianity, Judaism, and of the, both the Old and the New Testament's own art and literature. After the fall of the Roman Empire, Christianity ruled all of the known world, and so most of the art and literature that was done for the thousand years following the fall of the Roman Empire all related to biblical themes. So you can see the importance of the biblical tradition on the culture of Europe and our country. The Old Testament begins with the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And while there is some artwork that relates to those stories, most of the artwork that you see and the literature relates to what are called patriarchs. And the patriarchs are, are the men who followed God and who were leaders um, in the Jewish faith in the Old Testament. And so we have these four that are the most important that we're going to discuss. First, Abraham. Abraham was told by God that he needed to leave his home, which was Ur, and travel to an unknown place, Canaan, and to find a place for the Jewish people. And so God was moving him and he went on faith. Abraham is known for his faith, not knowing what God had in store. God also told him that he would be the father of many nations. Now that seemed a little inconceivable to him because his wife was not able to have a child. So he took matters into his own hands and he had relations with his wife's servant, Hagar. And from that union, there came a child, Ishmael. And Ishmael is the founder of the um, Arab people and is very prominent in the Muslim faith. And so the Muslims trace their roots back to Abraham, as do the Jews. Later, Abraham and his wife, Sarah, did have a child. That child was named Isaac. One particular story about Abraham is when he was asked by God to make a sacrifice, which is what they did in those times. They did blood sacrifices of an animal to God. And so he was asked to sacrifice to God, but God didn't tell him what the sacrifice would be. So when he got there, he was to sacrifice his son. And of course, this points the way towards Jesus in the New Testament. Um, just as he was about to kill his son, an angel stayed his hand. And so he did not sacrifice his son. And God told him, I know now that you put me before anything else. His son, Isaac had two children, Jacob and Esau. And the story associated with them is that Isaac gave his blessing to Jacob, who was the younger, even though they were twins, Jacob was the younger of the two, instead of to Esau, who was the older. And um, this was unusual in those times for the younger to have the blessing and he inherited everything from his father. Now, Jacob, whose name was later changed to Israel, and of course, the Jewish people are known as Israelites, and their country is Israel, so that's significant. Jacob had 12 children and um, 12 sons. He probably had more, but he had 12 sons. One of those sons was Joseph, and Joseph, through a series of events, um, wound up in Egypt. Mainly his, his brothers did not like him because Joseph was the favorite son. You may have heard before of Joseph in the coat of many colors. So, um, which was a coat Joseph was given by his father, Jacob. So his, his brothers contrived to send him off. So he was in Egypt and that is important because that is how the Hebrew people got to Egypt. That is the connection between an old society in the Middle East and a, the newer society in Egypt. That's, that's the connection and that becomes important for our next slide. The Hebrew people were enslaved by the Egyptians for 400 years. And after that initial contact with Joseph. So for 400 years they had been enslaved and they had wanted to go back home. 
um, to Israel. During this time period, Moses arose as a great leader. He was born a Hebrew, but he was put into a basket that floated down the Nile River because at that time the Egyptians were killing all Hebrew males who were two years and under. And in order to save his life, his mother put him in a basket so that he would not die. Well, he was found by the Pharaoh's daughter and raised by her in the Egyptian household. So he had all of the benefits of being raised in a royal home. Then later, as an adult, he discovered that he was actually Hebrew. And so he fled Egypt and he was in the desert for 40 years, I believe, where God taught him what he needed in order to lead the people out of Egypt. So one of the, the things when he returned to Egypt, he needed to get the Egyptian people's um, attention, particularly the Pharaoh. So 10 different plagues were put upon the Egyptian people. And after each one, Moses would tell the Pharaoh, who was Ramses II at that time, would, would tell them, let my people go. And then the Pharaoh would say that he was going to do it, but then he didn't. So then another plague would come, let my people go. The Pharaoh wouldn't let them go. So on and on it went until the final plague, which was killing the firstborn son of everything, cows, sheep, and of course of humans. And so Pharaoh's firstborn son died. And of course it did not happen to the Hebrew people because they put the, the blood of an animal over the doorpost, the lentils, the doorpost of their homes, so that the death angel would pass over them. And so when Pharaoh saw this, he said, yes, your, your God does have power. And yes, I will let you go. So they left Egypt and <clears throat> it was not easy. The Egyptian people followed them um, in horses and chariots, chasing them across the desert. And they backed up to a sea and they had nowhere to go. Moses took out his staff, put it down in the water, and the waters parted. And so the Hebrew people were able to walk across on dry land. When the Egyptians tried to follow, the waters closed over them, and they were all drowned. They did wander in the desert for 40 years. And um, as they were getting their way to, to the, the promised land, had all sorts of obstacles. And this is the during the time period when the Ten Commandments were given by God to Moses, Moses on Mount Sinai. So those very important feasts of Moses being out in the desert. But then Moses was not allowed to enter the Promised Land because he became angry towards the end of their time and he struck a rock in anger. So he did not enter the Promised Land, but then Joshua started leaving, leaving the Hebrew people. As mentioned earlier, Moses did not enter the promised land, but Joshua took over the helm at that point. And Joshua and Caleb were the two leaders who led the Hebrew people to conquer the promised land, the land that God had promised them um, when Moses first led them out of Egypt. Now, the way these two were picked were that they, um, there were 12 men who were sent as spies into the promised land, and they came back and reported uh, to Moses, and 10 of them said, we can't go in there. there there's too much. It, it's too hard. But two of them said, yes, we can. So 10 said no, two said go. And Joshua and Caleb said go, and they became the leaders. There are several, several stories in the Old Testament of all the obstacles that the Jewish people encountered when they were taking over the promised land. One of them was Jericho. At the city of Jericho, which was a walled city, now they built a wall around it to keep out invaders. And so when the Hebrew people encountered this wall, I mean, like other people groups, they, they knew they could not breach the wall. God said, if you will just walk around this walled city once a day for seven days, blowing your trumpets, on the seventh day it will fall. Now, that sounds like crazy advice for an army to do, but the people followed it, and that is exactly what happened, and it increased their, their faith. 
Another story from the Old Testament where you see a lot of artwork that relates to it is of David. Um, and one particular story about David is when he faced the giant Goliath. There was a group of people called the Philistines that the Hebrew people were fighting and they had this giant. No, no, no one could defeat him because of the giant. But David, who was a young shepherd boy, he believed that God was on his side. And so he was told to just shoot um, his slingshot with the pebbles at the giant. And so he did hit him in the head and it knocked him out and it killed him. And so David and the Hebrew people were successful. So the Hebrew people wanted a king. They had never had a king before, and all the other people groups around them had kings, and so they told God, we want a king as well. So God granted their desire and um, gave them a king, and the first one who was chosen, and he was chosen through the prophet Samuel that God guided, was Saul. So Saul was chosen to be their king, but he wound up not being a very good king. Um, a lot of things happened during his reign that were not good for the Hebrew people. And then towards the end of his life, he, he went crazy. He just went completely mad. And the only way that he could, he could gain some relief was when this young shepherd boy, David, would play his harp for him. Then he would have some relief um, from his mental illness. David was the next king of Israel. David was chosen again by the prophet Samuel, chosen from the family of Jesse, from the tribe of Jesse. And of Jesse's sons, he was the least among them, the, the least likely to become a king. But that was the one that God chose through Samuel. And David became a great king. Um, the Israelites gained in power and strength during his reign. But the main thing David is remembered for is his adultery with Bathsheba. Bathsheba was the wife of one of his generals in the army of Uriah, and but he saw Bathsheba bathing on the roof of a home. Now, I don't really understand that myself, but that's the way it was. And he saw her and he wanted her, and so he immediately sent word to have her husband killed in battle. And he took Bathsheba for himself, committed adultery, and they had a child um, who died. They did have other children later. But from that, David was, he, when he was confronted with his sin by the prophet Nathan, who came to him and said, look what you have done. It took, I won't go into all the details. It took him some amount of time for Nathan to convince David that he was sinful. And when David saw it, he repented. And he repented very strongly and he felt so sorry for what he had done to offend God and during that time that's when he wrote many of the Psalms Psalms that are familiar um, in literature um, as well as of course in Christian circles um, just begging forgiveness from God and then he wrote some Psalms that are more joyful as he gives thanks and praise to God so David is known as, as the writer of Psalms. He's also known as a man after God's own heart because after that, he really did pursue God diligently. He did have many sons who were very errant, who were errant. They were arrogant as well. Um, one Absalom who tried to take the throne from him and many times, I mean, through a series of years and Absalom was, was finally um, killed because as he was riding under a tree, to do battle against his father, um, a branch hit him in the neck and knocked him off um, his horse and he died. One of David's sons was Solomon and he became the next king of Israel. Solomon is particularly remembered for being very wise. Let me tell you a story about that. One time people brought to him two women who both claimed to have the same son. So um, what he he did was he said, okay, all right, y'all both y'all both claim uh, this boy, and so let's just let's just take a sword and just um, split him down the middle, and you can each have half. 
Well, when he said that, one of the women cried out and said, no, 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 the other woman can have her. And so obviously that, that was the true mother and um, she got her child. So one area where Solomon was not as wise was in the fact that he had many wives. God had specifically told him not to intermarry with the other people groups around them because of the polytheistic society that surrounded the very monotheistic society of the Hebrews. But Solomon did not heed that advice. He had many wives, and that eventually is what led to his fall. Um, another great thing he did was build the temple. The Jewish people had the temple or synagogue that was mobile that they carried through the desert all of that time. Whenever they wanted to worship God, they, they set it up and they had all of the different parts of the temple. Well, Solomon was the one who was um, given by God the task of building a permanent temple for the people. And that's what they wanted. They had been desiring that for decades. So he built that. But then because of his intermarriage with all of these different women, um, 700 wives and 300 concubines, yeah, he had a problem. Um, then the kingdom eventually was lost, and that is where the, there were no more kings. The kingdom was divided because it was divided because of these conquering people groups who came in and took over. And eventually, the Hebrews were forced into exile because they were overcome by the Babylonians. As I mentioned, after Solomon's death, the kingdom was split into two different kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern. And this was also the time of the prophets called the prophetic period because instead of having kings, God appointed certain prophets who would tell the people what God was saying, what God wanted them to do. So we have a series of prophets in the Old Testament and all those books are named by various prophets, Isaiah and Jeremiah, Nahum, Habakkuk, all of those. So the northern kingdom was destroyed by Assyria in the 700s which incidentally, this would be the same time period that the, that the Estruscans were establishing their culture in Italy. And then the Southern Kingdom, which as I mentioned, was conquered by the Babylonians in 587, and the, the temple was destroyed by the Babylonians. That temple that Solomon had built was destroyed. And so the Hebrew people were taken into captivity in Babylon. After being exiled in Babylon for close to 70 years, the Jews were returned to Israel in 520 BC. And they rebuilt the temple, which was significant for them. After that, there were several far, foreign rulers, one of whom was Alexander the Great that we studied in chapter three, but they were taken over by several far, foreign rulers until finally being conquered by Rome. The Jews held out for a long time against Rome, did all they could to hold out against them, but they were finally conquered in 63 BC. What you see in the background to this slide is Masada. Masada is this high flat mountain that you see behind us where um, a portion of the Jewish people hold up in the caves outside of Masada and fought against the Roman army for months. They, just a small band of Jewish people, held off the entire Roman army. There are lots of books about it. It's highly interesting. That just shows you the determination, the resilience of the Jewish people as they held off the Roman army. The word Bible comes from the Greek name for Jebel, and then that name is Biblios, and this is an ancient city where papyrus reed was used to make books and books were exported from Biblios. So that's where the name Bible comes from. The Old Testament is divided into three sections, the law or Torah or Pentateuch. And the law or Torah, this is the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And then in the Old Testament, we have the prophets that I mentioned before, which the um, longer works, are the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and the shorter works like Daniel, Obadiah, Nahum, Habakkuk um, are named for those men who were prophets in Israel. And then the writings. The writings consist of Psalms that I've mentioned that are the songs of David and Proverbs. These are wise sayings from Solomon. 
together. All of that is the canon. The canon is the accepted list of works in the Bible. The canon of the Old Testament was established about 90, 90 CE. Um, and the canon for the New Testament was much later. And there, there's always some questions of surrounding the canon. Because a group of rabbis decided the Old Testament books, but there was another group who believed that an ancient Greek version of the Hebrew scriptures should be in the canon. That ancient Greek version of the Hebrew scriptures is called the Septuagint. And so there are some books that are that were in the Septuagint that were not accepted into the canon. And some of those books are today used by um, some branches of the Catholic Church. It's called the Apocrypha. Works such as First and Second Maccabees and Tobit are in the Apocrypha, and it comes from the Septuagint. The canon for the New Testament was much later um, by a group of um, Christians several hundred years later. One way that the rab rabbis decided upon the books that were going to make it into the canon of the Old Testament was the appearance of motifs. A motif is a recurrent image that tends to unify a work. So they were looking for recurrent images or themes that were in every single book that unified the Old Testament as a whole. One of those motifs is monotheism. Monotheism is a belief in one God, one God only, and that is opposed to henotheism, which is a belief in one God, but there are many other gods, like the Egyptians had many other gods, but they focused on the sun god, Aten Ra. And then polytheism, which is a belief in several, several different gods, the Hebrew people were different from all of the other people groups that lived around them at that time because they believed in one God. Another biblical motif is the idea of covenant. And this is the idea that God says, I will be your God and you will be my people. And so in Hebrew history, um, God has always been faithful to that covenant, to being a being the people's God, and then um, they would defer to him. So the one of the first ideas of covenant is when God says after the flood that occurs in Genesis, and this is with Noah and the ark, that God says to the people, I will not flood the world again. And so as a sign of that, he gives the rainbow. So covenant, the idea of I will be your God and you will be my people, has different signs. And so um, with, with that covenant, there's a difference between the Old Covenant, which is sometimes called the Old Testament. So the word testament is a synonym for covenant. And the New Covenant, which is in the New Testament. So the sign of the Old Covenant or Old Testament is circumcision of males. So that in, during the, the time of the Hebrew people, to distinguish themselves from the other people groups that were polytheistic and to say that they believed in one God, the males were circumcised. In the New Testament, the sign of believing in God and specifically of believing in God because of a saving faith in his son, Jesus Christ, is baptism. So the different testaments have different signs for their covenant. So the New Testament, the sign of belief in God is baptism. Another motif that runs throughout the Bible is, of course, the idea of ethics. What is right or wrong? We first see that with the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments that, that were given to Moses on Mount Sinai during the period of the Exodus. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not have any false witnesses against me. Thou shalt, not, thou shalt honor thy parents. Honor the name of the Lord thy God. All of those that perhaps you have heard of before. And then the prophets. The prophets were the ones who enforced those ethics, who told the Hebrew people what God was saying and what he would have them do. Another biblical motif is the idea of models and types. I mentioned this earlier about Abraham, that he is known for faith and that he serves as a model for people to come of having faith. 
And also we have that with Solomon. He serves as a model of wisdom. Ruth, the book of Ruth in the Old Testament serves as a model of loyalty because Ruth was very loyal to her mother-in-law after um, their husbands had died, stayed with her and was rewarded for that. So there are various people that we see throughout the Bible who are models or who serve as a type for a specific character trait. Duryopolis is a town in Syria that was destroyed by Persian armies in 256 AD, but then covered by desert sands for nearly 1700 years. It was discovered in the 1930s, and it was this town was dated back to 250 AD. This town is very important to us because in it we see all of the different religions of the Roman Empire, and there were several in the 3rd and 4th centuries. And so there were pagan temples that were there, there were Christian churches, and then also there was a Jewish synagogue. The discovery of the synagogue was particularly important because on the walls of the synagogue there were frescoes, and a fresco is a painting made on wet plaster, and it showed scenes from the Old Testament. For example, there was a scene showing Moses leading the people out of Egypt, so Moses and the Exodus also scenes from the life of Abraham and Isaac. So it really just um, reinforced that the Jewish people were an important part um, during the Roman Empire. Christianity has its roots in Judaism because Jesus Christ was born a Jew. Jesus Christ is the whole entire focus of Christianity. It is a belief in him for saving faith and a belief that he is the Son of God. Christianity has its roots in Judaism, just as the New Testament has its roots in the Old Testament. One such way is that a Messiah was foretold in an Old Testament book called Isaiah. It was foretold that there would be a person who would come and who would save um, all of mankind from their sins, and that specifics about the life of Jesus were foretold in Isaiah, and they came true in the New Testament. Jesus was born to Mary and Joseph. Mary was a Jewish girl. She was a virgin, and she was engaged to be married to Joseph when she became pregnant. She was, obviously it was a hard time in that she was pregnant and not married to Joseph yet, but Joseph was told by an angel that she had not been unfaithful, that she had been impregnated by the Holy Spirit, and that she was carrying the Son of God. So he did not leave her, and they did have Jesus nine months later in Bethlehem. They had traveled to Bethlehem because that was the city of David, and Joseph was of the family of David. He was in the lineage of King David from the Old Testament that we talked about, and they had to go there to pay their taxes. At this time, it was a Roman-occupied land, and the Jewish people had to pay taxes um, to the Roman government. So they had gone there to pay their taxes, and at that time, Mary gave birth to Jesus, and commonly it's said to be a stable, but it was probably a cave. Um, she gave birth to Jesus in a cave, and then they could not go home because they were being um, chased by Herod, who was on the lookout for this Messiah to come, and so he was killing Jewish babies to and under, just like we saw what happened in Egypt with Jewish babies to and under. And so they had to go flee to Egypt for a while before they came back to Israel, specifically to Galilee. We don't know much about Jesus' life while he was growing up. We know that Joseph was a carpenter, and it was likely that Jesus was as well. Jesus began his earthly ministry at age 30. He was preceded by his cousin, John the Baptist, who foretold that Jesus was coming. There was one who was coming who was the Messiah, who was the one that was there to save the people. So he started teaching and preaching and healing people in Galilee at the age of 30 years old. The word Christ means anointed one. When Jesus was the Savior promised by the ancient biblical prophets that he would bring about God's kingdom, and that's what he preached. And it upset a lot of the Jewish officials. It upset two sects of Jews called the Pharisees and the Sadducees, 
and so eventually they conspired with the Roman government to have him crucified. So he was crucified at the age of 33 by both the Jewish officials, primarily the Jewish high priest Caiaphas, and the Roman officials. The governor of Judea at that time was Pontius Pilate, and so he was crucified um, at the instruction of these two men in the coolest form of crucifixion known to the Romans, which was on a cross. He carried his own cross up Golgotha, which is the hill upon which he was crucified, and he was uh, nailed to the cross and likely died of suffocation. He was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, who was um, a Jew who followed him and who was wealthy, and so he had a tomb where he could be buried, which was you know, in the in the side of a hill. It's not like our 21st century burial um, practices. But then after three days, he was resurrected. Two women went to his tomb to um, minister to the body because they had not been able to properly prepare the body for burial because he died um, on Friday night, which is the beginning of the Jewish Sabbath from Friday night to Saturday night. So they went early Sunday morning to prepare his body and they saw that he was not there. And so he was resurrected and he was he showed himself to his disciples um, and over 500 other people saw him after his resurrection. And this one event, the resurrection, is the centerpiece of Christian faith. It is what those who follow Christ base their faith on, that he was God and that he did rise from the dead and that he now currently sits at the right hand of the Father of God in heaven. After a time after his resurrection, after he had time with his disciples, he did then ascend to heaven. Christianity spread rather slowly as far as religions grow. Go, but one of the main people who helped spread Christianity was a man named Saul of Tarsus. Saul was converted as he was on his way traveling from Tarsus to Damascus, and on that road, a light blinded him, and he um, was told that he would testify to the power of Jesus. And so, Prior to that time, he had been persecuting Christians. He actually held the cloaks of those who persecuted one of the earliest Christian martyrs. His name was Stephen. But then he was made to see. On the road to Damascus, a light blinded him, and he was blinded, of course, physically, but also spiritually. And then he was able to go to the home of someone who was a believer there in Damascus and after a few days, three, I think, um, then he was able to see again and he testified to the power of Christ and he came to believe in the veracity of what Christ claimed, that Christ was God and that he had been resurrected from the dead. From that time on, he was a strong and tireless worker in the cause of Christianity. His main contribution was that he spread Christianity to the Gentiles. He started churches all over um, the area and into Asia and into uh, parts of Europe. So he started many different churches like in Philippi and that's the book of Philippians was written to them. In Rome and the book of Romans was written to them. So those books that he wrote in the New Testament are letters or sometimes they're called epistles to the new churches that he started. He went on three very long missionary journeys, and of course, he is known as the first missionary. I forgot to say in the last slide that Saul's name was changed to Paul, and that is what he is known as in the New Testament as Paul. He was executed in the city of Rome in 62 AD. The Christians all over were being persecuted at this time, as is shown by Paul was killed there in Rome, um, because they were secretive in nature because they would not bow to the Roman government. They would not bow to the Roman gods and goddesses. And so they just kind of, you know, stayed in the background for that reason because they knew that they would be persecuted because the Romans had to have allegiance to their government and to their gods. They were not active politically. 
and they refuse to acknowledge those Roman gods. Hiatus, which is a combination of love and reverential fear, and you had to express pietas, this combination of love and reverential fear, to your parents, to the state, which would be to the Roman government, and to the gods, little g, plural. And so the Christians could not do that because being a Christian means that you pledge allegiance to Christ. You say that he is the God. There is no one above him. There is no one else. He is the one. Christians cannot say that. And so the early Christians were persecuted for that refusal. And because the Christians were being persecuted, there arose a need for apologists. And apologist doesn't mean you're saying, I'm sorry. It means a defense, just like we had with the apology of Socrates, the defense of Socrates. These apologists were defending the faith. Two of the main apologists were Tertullian and Justin Martyr. Now, Martyr was beheaded in 165 AD, and yes, that is where we get our English word martyr, which means one who dies for his faith. Early Christian art was all done in the catacombs. Now, catacombs are tunnel-like areas beneath the surface of the earth where originally people were buried. So the Christians had no money. They had no political clout, no money. And so you had to have money to buy land to bury your dead. So the Christians could not bury their dead in normal graveyards. And so they went under the ground so where they could bury their dead. And so as they were burying their dead there, then they started decorating. They started, um, you know, as people do, we all like to do that. Um, and so that's why the Christian art is found there. Now, eventually they did start meeting in the catacombs, but that was not the original place where Christians met for worship. Originally, they buried their dead there, and then they started meeting there. But there, that's where the um, earliest Christian art is found. It's found in the frescoes. And remember, a fresco is a painting on wet plaster. So these frescoes that were done on the walls of the catacombs or caves, and then there are glass sculptures and um, sculptures made of other materials that were there, found there in the catacombs, and then inscriptions that were placed on the grave. The frescoes are interesting because often we have the convergence of three traditions coming together in the painting of these frescoes, Christian, Jewish, and Roman. There is one in your textbook on page 205 entitled The Good Shepherd, where you see the convergence of these three traditions. And you also see it in this slide right here where we have Christ teaching the apostles. It's dated to about 300 AD. You see Christ there in the middle with um, his wings indicating you know, divinity, angels, and his disciples. And what is interesting is that they have very Roman haircuts. I mean, they look more European than they do Middle Eastern. And um, then you have some, at the top of the fresco, you have some Roman, more Roman designs. So it is interesting that you have these three cultures coming together in these frescoes. This fresco is not in your textbook, but I really like it because it shows the beginnings of artistic themes that we see down through the ages, we see for the next thousand years and even into the present day. So this fresco is of Madonna and Child, the Virgin and Child, which is called the Madonna, um, that is one of the first known depictions of that. So you see Mary here leaning over the child Jesus, and then you see probably this other figure on the left is probably Isaiah as he foretells the birth of Jesus. The Good Shepherd is one of the most enduring figures of early Christian art. You see it in frescoes, you see it in the inscriptions, and then you see it in sculpture form as you see here. Jesus is known as the Good Shepherd, um, as the one who would go out and search for one person who would come to him. And this is taken from a biblical parable, something that we have in the New Testament in the Gospels. Oh, and if I didn't mention earlier, the Gospels are the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The word gospel means good news, and so the tale of the Good Shepherd is found in all four of the Gospels. The Good Shepherd 
is one who has a hundred sheep. And so 99 are in the pen at night and one is missing. So the good shepherd will go out and search for the one who is missing. And that is a good metaphor for Jesus searching for the one who needs to come to him. And so that's why it's such an enduring picture of the Christian faith for Christians. So the good shepherd here symbolizes Jesus and the sheep on his back is the one person who is lost and who needs to come to saving faith. So this is one of the sculptures that was found down in the catacombs. This slide is an example of a Christian inscription. This would be at the burial of someone in the catacombs and notice the cross that you see on the block in the center. This would be one of the earliest times that the cross was used because remember the cross was a symbol of torture for the Romans. So it was several hundred years before the cross which is commonly seen as a symbol of Christianity today, but it was several hundred years before it was actually used. Fast forward 300 years to Constantine. You remember Constantine as the last great emperor of antiquity. We studied him in chapter four with the Romans and Constantine was converted to Christianity during his reign. And he is the one who made Christianity the religion of the Roman empire, in effect, establishing the Roman Catholic church. Constantine is also known for having built two very famous churches, one in Rome and one in Jerusalem. The first is St. Peter's Basilica, which of course is the home of the Pope, is at the, at the Vatican City in Rome today. And its name comes from Peter, who was known as the first Pope. Peter was one of the disciples who you know, lived during Jesus' time, so actually apostle. And he was very close to Jesus throughout his life. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre, sepulchre means grave. So this is believed to be the site where Jesus was buried, and it is in Jerusalem. Here is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre with its uh, very Roman domes that you can see. You can actually see them much better at, in the picture in your textbook on page 210. But here you have a picture of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. Here you have a picture of St. Peter's Basilica, and you can see the floor plan of that in your book, page 209. I just want to point out, if you look at the people who are standing in front of the basilica, then that tells you the scale of this building. Note, of course, the Roman dome with its oculus on top. Note that you have Corinthian columns across the front. And then you have this obelisk, which is interesting as you see this all over Europe. The idea came from Egypt, but you have it all over Europe and even in this country. So this is St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. While the visual arts of early Christianity turned to Roman and Greek models for inspiration, the music of the early Christian church turned to Jewish models. In early Jewish music, there was singing or chanting of the sacred text and that is what the Christians did as well. This chanting was influenced by the various conquerors who conquered the Jewish people, and some of the music and some of the instruments that were used came from other people groups in the Middle East who had conquered the Jewish people. Early on, early Christian music was professional because that's the way that the Jews had done it. And so it was the singing um, was done only by professionals but then the council at Laodicea said they did not like that. Um, and so they said there should just be one paid performer. That one paid performer was called the cantor. And there's one cantor for each congregation. And so they didn't really want there to be a lot of elaboration so different from our music and worship today. By the fourth century, the standard form of music in Christian churches was either responsorial, where you had the cantor who would give you lines from usually a psalm, and then the congregation responded with a simple ref refrain. And there is um, responsive readings in churches today follow this same format. The other type of music in the early Christian church was antiphonal. Antiphonal singing is when you have parts of the congregation or the cantor in the congregation who would alternate verses of a psalm in a simple chanting tone. So 
It was not exactly singing. It was more chanting, but it was it paved the way for the worship, the singing that we have today. <laughs> 